So this link is only for few of us, no? Or you can see everybody. No, so this we can is send for everybody. To... Recorded, no, Yogita? Yes, madam. We'll get a YouTube link in a shorter period. Okay. So we can uh, access that link for a week after the webinar. Oh, okay. We are live now. Yes. Yeah, we are live now. Amla madam has also joined. So I guess we'll start now. So... Good evening, uh, all my seniors and respected uh, colleagues. Today, uh, we are touching very important topic. Because of ERAs, the regional anesthesia importance has grown day by day. And easy accessibility of USG to anesthesiologists has changed the face of regional anesthesia from leaps and bounds. So we are touching very important two topics today and very eminent speakers we have invited for same. Uh, for today's webinar coordinator, I invite Dr. Viral Parekh, who is our UA, very enthusiastic uh, regional anesthesiologist. So over to Viral for further proceeding. Thank you, madam, for uh, the kind introduction. So a very good evening to all of you. On behalf of IIC Mumbai Metro Branch and uh, Society of Anesthesia Maharashtra State, I invite all of you for this webinar. So today's topic for webinar is navigating trunkal blocks and anesthesiologist perspectives. So as all of us know that with the advent of ultrasound uh, and its clinical application in anesthesia, the regional level anesthesia has evolved tremendously in the last two de decades. And we are moving specifically towards the distal blocks, the procedure specific and the motor sparing blocks. So today we'll be discussing the thoracic and abdominal wall blocks, including the newer blocks and their clinical applications. We have an esteemed eminent faculty with us in the form of speakers, Dr. Harshal Vak, sir, and Dr. Amit Rikshit, sir, and our very own Dr. Deepa Kani, madam, as the moderator. I welcome all of you, and for further proceedings, I hand over to Dr. Deepa, madam, to please continue the session. Thank you. Thank you, Iral, and uh, good evening, all of you. And I thank uh, Dr. Amla Kuralkar, President ISA Mumbai Metro Branch and Organizing Secretary, Dr. Yogita Patil for giving us this opportunity. And uh, there's a little change in sequence of lectures. We start with the uh, uh, chest wall blocks by Dr. Harshal Vag. And as Viral has said that just a decade back, we were on thoracic epidurals and we moved on to thoracic paravertebrates and all types of chest blocks right from parasternal to pecs to serratus to the paraspinal, the directus spinae and the telef and all sorts of blocks, which I'm sure Herschel will explain very clearly. And it is today very important that you know all these blocks in detail because they are part of multimodal analgesia. And uh, we, as teachers also, we should understand which of these blocks should be core competencies in anesthesia practice and core competencies for teaching anesthesia students. Now, about Harshal Vag, he doesn't require much uh, introduction as he's one of the most popular regional anesthetists. He's consultant with the Kokilabai Ambani Hospital, Mumbai, with special interest in regional obstetrics and anesthesia for oncosurgery and robotic surgeries. He's mentor for Aora Regional Anesthesia Fellowship. He has publications in national and international journals. He was also listed as the top docs of Mumbai in India Today magazine in August 2019 and the best doctors of uh, Mumbai 2020 in the Outlook magazine. Over to Dr. Harshan Vak. Thank you, Deepa, madam. And majority of those accolades, I think all of you are contributor factors in that. But whoever has, has, I've worked under uh, has contributed to all those accolades and I'm eternally grateful for all of them. So special thanks, uh, good evening everybody, special thanks to um, uh, Society of Anesthesiologists Maharashtra chapter and IIS in Mumbai for this opportunity. It is always a great pleasure to share the stage or maybe share the screen this time with uh, Dr. Amit Dikshit who is uh, also, though junior to me, is, is my teacher as well. So Amit, thank you for allowing me to, to speak before because we thought that to start with the, the chest wall makes sense then then go on to abdominal wall blocks. I'm not going to talk too much about this slide because I think it's an old slide now. It's just bark and shells. Uh, so I'll get on. I have a lot of things to cover. So I'll I'll try and um, uh, 
be as quick as possible. I think the 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 uh, the the topic of the webinar is is aptly named navigating trunkle wall uh, trunkle wall blocks or trunkle blocks because I think navigate when you think of navigation you think of sort of block uh, you think of uh, maps you think of anatomy and I think half the battle or more than half the battle is one especially in chest wall blocks and abdominal wall blocks if you know the anatomy and then doing the blocks and putting local anesthetic in those special planes is just part of the things but knowing the anatomy uh, is 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 important so i'm going to spend a, a little bit more time on the anatomy because once you understand the anatomy then you don't need much nomenclature or you know where to put those local anesthetics then you can leave the nomenclature aside uh i just wanted to say that uh, we have been doing these blocks in the institute for a long period of time we have grown in terms of uh, what blocks we do for which patients as we have learned over the years, how the facial plane blocks work as well, our practices have changed. We have presented this uh, as a podium poster in 2018, uh, which was for high-risk breast uh, surgery patients, which we did under sort of a combination of blocks. The same we, uh, we published uh, in the International Journal of Aids and Asia. This is about 61 patient ASA 3-4. Uh, who were actually not really fit to have a general anesthetic or high risk to have general anesthetic and were otherwise would have been given a palliative uh, treatment. But if not for these so blocks, we did those procedures. And uh, again, as I said, there are a lot of blocks given during these times and we learned over the process what blocks we need to tailor to those specific type of procedures and incisions as we went along. So that's just a quick quick video. This is a typical patient posted for left uh, medic, uh, modified radical mastectomy with a full uh, axillary dissection. She was 75, hypertensive diabetic, chronic kidney disease, low EVF, you know, admitted multiple times for congestive cardiac failure. I mean, otherwise, previously, we would have probably said, you know what, she has some, we we'll put her on some palliative medicine and from not probably not fit from surgery point of view. So we sort of tried these, as I said, we learned over the period of time. So she had a paravertebral block and a combination of few other chest wall blocks. We usually try and sedate patients because, um, you know, they, 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 we have realized over the period of time that the acceptance is much better. They are much happier at the end of the procedure. So you can see that she's peacefully sleeping and this is immediately at the end of the procedure. She's sort of, the consent has been taken for this video. So the patient has given consent. So she's shifting herself from the bed onto the, the, her bed itself. So, just to prove a point that we are not completely knocked her off and she sort of had some sort of conscious sedation and she was able to move herself from the operating table to her bed. So this patient had a three level thoracic paravertebral block. We put some local anesthetic at the pex two level and a parasternal, which is a pecto intercostal facial plane block. See, so a few images of that to cover the medial part of the chest wall. Um, another one is a thoracoscopy, 70 year old, similar sort of a medical history, complete collapse of one lung, massive pleural effusion, again, low EF. Uh, the surgeon had planned a th diagnostic thoracoscopy and uh, taking um, uh, biopsies from the thoracic internal uh, uh, pleural wall. This lady oh, had a Ram thoracic Ram. paravertebral block. And you can see that um, uh, Ram she's, Ram uh, Ram tolerating Ram. Uh, the procedures um, um, without much. We gave her no sedation because she was saturating. This, she's saturating 100 now because we used Thrive on her, but otherwise she was saturating end of sort of 80, 85s uh, before the procedure started. And I'll just quickly run through the video just to show that she's sort of comfortably sleeping. She had no sedation during this procedure. She had two ports put in and the surgeon is uh, taking good bites of the pleura which uh, for diagnostic purposes. So that was something that is we have been doing on and off on uh, whenever we get these high risk patients and they are working quite well. I also want to clear one thing is I whenever we talk about these blocks, we get a lot of questions asked by uh, candidates during the procedure that many of our surgeons don't allow because um, uh, the the cautery doesn't work when uh, when the fluid is in the, that area or the surgeon says that we want to stimulate the nerves so. Uh, we don't want local anesthetic, which is going to block those nerves. Now, we have a fairly busy uh, uh, breast oncology unit and our surgeons don't complain. In fact, they complain if they don't see local anesthetic in those special plane blocks because then they say that that means the block is not going to work. So they are fairly happy with the local anesthetic that is being seen in the facial planes that uh, that comes in the way. And you can see he's using the cautery and you can see the local anesthetic fluid which is seeped around in all these areas which are sort of whitish because those local anesthetic has seeped in and there is absolutely no problem in terms of the using of the cautery in the presence of any sort of fluid especially local anesthetic uh, 
Uh, so that's probably no excuse from uh, anyone's point of view that local anesthetic causes any hindrance to the use of cautery. Uh, from uh, anatomy point of view and understanding the facial plane blocks, I would highly recommend these two articles to read. This is Perioperative Breast Analgesia, Qualitative Review of Anatomy and Regional Anesthetic Techniques, which came in RAPM 2017. The nomenclature has changed a little bit since then, but that is great at least to understand the anatomy and what type of facial plane blocks one can do. Similar is this relatively recent 2007, uh, 2021 in anesthesia about ultrasound guided facial plane blocks of the chest wall by KJ Chin et al. I think these both are great reads in understanding the anatomy and putting off local anesthetic in those facial planes. When you actually talk about facial plane blocks, be it thoracic or be it abdominal, I think there are so many blocks available now. And I think everybody has put some sort of local anesthetic in some sort of facial plane above or below some muscle that is already there within few centimeters of each other. So you have epidural, you have the thoracic paravertebral, you have the MTP, ITP, IFB, TTP. I think only XYZ is left of the, of the letters that are remaining in the alphabet. Otherwise, everything else has been used in. And... If you, if I think in the most recent IJ journal, there was this SPSIPB block, which is serratus posterior superior intercostal facial plane blocks. Uh, that was, I think, one of the recent, I sort of roughly went through it. And after looking at all these blocks, I think everybody remembers this dialogue as, is you really don't know which, which, which uh, blocks to do for what. Again, if you understand the anatomy, I think you're going to be able to do those blocks without knowing too much of the nomenclature. So I'll quickly go through the anatomy as well. So this is a cross section of uh, of the uh, thoracic area um, uh, showing, you know, that's the lung and um, uh, that's the vertebral body. The, on the sides are the spinous or uh, the transverse processes and that's the spinous process. To the transverse process are attached all the intercostal muscles. The... <clears throat> nerve root that comes out of the intervertebral foramen gives off a ventral ramus which continues as the intercostal nerves and a dorsal ramus that mainly supplies the skin subcute muscles uh, ah. about the midline of the back and a little bit lateral to it okay now this at this area also has connections with the sympathetic chain now that is an important factor in terms of the quality of pain relief that one would get with an epidural and a paravertebral walk as compared to a chest wall blocks because that element of of sympathetic uh, nerve uh, blockade is sort of almost eliminated in terms of where you go peripheral to the chest wall blocks. Uh, so coming back to the anatomy, this uh, the ventral ramus then continues as a typical spinal nerve and an intercostal nerves. This follows the contour of the chest and lies inferior to the rib in between the intercostal muscles. So the three intercostal muscles from outside is the external intercostal muscle. I mean, between is the internal intercostal muscle and then is the innermost intercostal muscle. So the, the nerve or the, spa, the thoracic spinal nerve or the intercostal nerve, as you may call it, lies between the, inter, um, the innermost intercostal muscle and the internal intercostal muscle. Okay. Uh, we'll leave this part of the anatomy at the back for the time being and we'll come back to the front of the chest. Now, again, muscles are important in terms of identifying your sonar anatomy as well as understanding the nerve supply of this front of the chest. We know that the majority of the, the musculature that is occupied by the front of the chest is the pectoralis major muscle. As you can see, it is it's sort of attached on the clavicle, the sternum, and goes and attaches on the bicipital groove of the humerus. On the right side, you can see the pectoralis major is, is sort of lifted off, and you can see the pectoralis minor, which is attached to the third, fourth, fifth rib, and goes and attached to the coracoid posterior of the scapula. So these two muscles are something that you're going to be there in the front of the chest. As you come a little bit more lateral, beyond the lateral edge of the pectoralis major, you're going to have the serratus anterior. The serratus usually has these serrations which are fixed on to the ribs and then and the back of it which is attached to the scapula. And further down posteriorly is your latissimus dorsi. So coming back to this pectoralis major, just to mention that the innervation arises uh, from the brachial plexus, which is the medial and the lateral pectoral nerves. The pectoralis minor also gets his nerve supply from the, the brachial plexus, which is the medial pectoral. That's how the serratus anterior is attached. It's attached one bit to the, to the scapula and many of those serrations go and attach to the ribs, usually from ribs first to ninth on the outer surfaces. And the latissimus dorsi, which covers the the, uh, the posterior bit of the serratus anterior is also attached to the majority of the th thoracic and the lumbar vertebrae and again goes and attaches to the 
the humerus. Now, nerve supply, both these muscles again comes from brachial plexus because the serratus anterior is supplied by the uh, long thoracic nerve of Bell and the, the latissimus dorsi is supplied by the thoracodorsal nerve. So again, the point I'm making is the nerve supply of most of the muscles of the chest wall or majority of the muscle of the chest wall is comes from the brachial plexus. Obviously, the intercostal nerves are sub, intercostal nerves supply the intercostal muscles. Coming back again to the chest, um, chest wall as such, you can see the three mus muscles, which are the intercostal muscle, as the external, internal, and the innermost. And the neurovascular bundle is sort of sandwiched between the uh, internal intercostal muscle and the innermost. So when you want to do an intercostal nerve block nowadays with, with the ultrasound, you can probably do it at any point of time where you see the vascular structure, which is the artery and do the nerve block between these two muscles. Uh, again, from chest wall point of view, it is also important to understand you're basically catching the intercostal nerves at various points and that gives the definition of most of the chest wall block. So if you catch it at the paravertebral, you're going to paravertebral block as you go along the contour of the chest. The, the the nomenclature of the the chest wall blocks uh, change again continuing i keep i'm going to keep repeating uh, for a little bit because until we get the anatomy right we are not going to understand how the chest wall blocks work so the the, the thoracic uh, or the intercostal nerve sort of winds around the winds around the contour of the chest almost midway gives off a lateral cutaneous branch now this lateral cutaneous branch sort of pierces all the three intercostal muscles pierces the serratus anterior and then again branches into two, the anterior and the posterior branch. The anterior branch sort of goes on top of the serratus anterior and then comes back and supplies a bit of the anterior part of the chest as well. Same does the, the posterior branch of the lateral cutaneous, uh, uh, lateral cutaneous uh, segment. Now it is important to note how this nerve, when it bifurcates or, when, or divides into two, lies on top of the serratus anterior. So that's where Again, your local anesthetic deposition is going to be important because that's where the nerves are going to be. So one can see on the right side of this picture that this, this network sort of covers most of the chest wall where the thoracic, uh, the, the intercostal nerve runs between the innermost and the internal intercostal membrane at the, uh, uh, or muscle rather. At the midpoint, it gives off this lateral cutaneous branch. One goes anteriorly, one goes posteriorly. All this runs on the face of the, the serratus anterior. Then as it comes, um, as it comes towards the the center of the uh, the chest wall, it again pierces the intercostal muscles and gives off two branches, which sort of make a network on on top of on top of each other and uh, sort of supply the entire part of the chest wall. Okay, so if you look at from the side of the chest with the musculature on, that's the pectoralis major. You can see these uh, the lateral cutaneous branches, which comes usually between the serrations or the the individual parts of the serratus anterior as they come out and uh, give these anterior and posterior cutaneous branches. It's also important to note that the intercostobrachial is an important part of the nerve supply, especially when you're going to do the axilla because that's where the uh, the axillary lymph node dissection will take its nerve supply from. There is also some part of the medial cutaneous uh, nerve of the arm which is sort of takes its supply from there as well. Again, <clears throat> uh, it's important because when you're putting local anesthetic in this area, you want to know uh, if you're going to do an axillary, uh, an axillary dissection, where to put the local anesthetic. And if you put local anesthetic there, whether it's going to work or not. <clears throat> Continuing with the, uh, the, the, uh, the cutaneous nerve supply, again, in addition to the intercostal nerves that supply majority of the breast tissue, it is a soft tissue. You also need to understand that the upper part of the breast soft tissue or just below the clavicle, the nerve supply comes from, from the supraclavicular nerve, which are part of the superficial cervical plexus. So that's now you understand that the, the at least the soft tissue nerve supply of the anterior part of the chest wall, including the breast tissue, is supplied from the brachial plexus, it's supplied from the intercostal nerves, it's supplied from the supraclavicular nerves. And that's to keep in mind of how the blood, uh, the nerve supply comes from. So if you broadly classify um, uh, the, the uh, chest wall blocks, this is not a sort of published uh, nomenclature, but this is just 
looking at how the anatomy goes. So if you start with the central neural axle, you know there's a thoracic epidural. As you come a little lateral, it becomes thoracic paravertebral. You come a little more paraspinal, it becomes the erector spinae block or the retrolaminar block. Then there are the uh, midpoint to transverse process, then the intertransverse process. So you can see brachial plexus, supraclavicular, then the chest wall blocks. As you go along, the contour of the chest becomes the serratus posterior, so the, the newer block, which is the serratus posterior superior intercostal plane block. Then you come to the serratus, which can be superficial or deep. Then you come to the serratus interfacial plane blocks, then you call the intercostal nerve blocks. Then you come to the pectoralis, and then finally you come back to the center of the chest near the sternum, which becomes the parasternal nerve. Block. Now, I know we have been thinking about these blocks in the in the term for, and we have Dr. Rafael Blanco to thank because he has sort of opened the Pandora's box in terms of the uh, facial plane blocks. But in 2021, obviously, uh, this sort of good uh, consensus study came out about changing or standardizing the nomenclature in regional anesthesia, which I think helped a lot because then the confusion about which is specs one, which is specs two, which is deep serrator, which is you know, superficial serratus and while doing the block, then the students would keep asking, or even we would keep wondering, Are do you want to give PEX1? Do you want to give PEX2? Which which affects what? So I think that's, they have con con consoled this very nicely where they have converted one into a paraspinal, a paraspinal group where paravertebral block is basically putting local anesthetic between uh, below the superior costal transverse ligament and the pleura. The intertransverse process block is between the two transverse process below the uh, intertransverse ligament and the MTP is sorry carry on mute yourself continue Harshal. okay sorry then the MTP is sort of halfway between the, the transverse process and the pleura I think the intertransverse process block and the MTP block is pretty much similar in terms of where the local anesthetic is deposited. We all know about the erector spinae block where the local anesthetic is put between the erector spinae muscle and the transverse process. The lateral laminar block comes a little bit more medial to it where the, it is just below the erector spinae, but at the laminar level. So that's basically how they have compiled the paraspinal nerve block. When you come form to the chest wall blocks, they have divided it into a, a superficial serratus plane block and a deep serratus plane block. Superficial is fairly easy to understand it's superficial to the serratus anterior. Deep is between the serratus anterior and the peri periosteum of the lip. Then you become the, come to the, <coughs> so we'll start from here as well. So if you take the pex one, which is between the pectoralis major and the minor, they have now termed it as an interpectoral plane block. If it is with the pex two, which used to be between the pectoralis minor and the serratus, they have now called it as a pectoserratus. I think it's fairly easy to understand between the pecs is interpectoral, between the pecs and the serratus is pectoserratus. If you're putting it above the serratus, it becomes superficial serratus, and below that is going to be the deep serratus. I think fairly good understanding of where the local anesthetic is put. So if you look at this picture, I think it gives you a rough idea of what they're talking about. So if you're going to do paraspinal or para sort of vertebral, it becomes paravertebral block, it becomes the erector spinae block. You can add the retrolaminar and the MTP and the ITP in this group. When you come around the contour of the chest, that be going to become your sort of uh, serratus block. So either a superficial serratus or a deep serratus. Then your comes your pectoral group of blocks, which is the interpectoral or the pectoserratus. And then comes your parasternal blocks, which is going to be either a PIFP, which is the pecto intercostal facial plane blocks, which is between the pectoralis or just underneath the pectoralis major and if you go even even sort of internally between the uh, pectoralis major and the uh, transverse thoracic it becomes the TTP block. We'll come to that in a bit. Okay. Now, if you look at actual surgical dissection, right, on the left side is, is the, uh, the actual picture of a breast which is dissected. This is the pectoralis major which has been retracted back. That's the pectoralis minor. That's the lateral edge of the pectoralis minor. The serratus anterior is sitting a majority of the of the chest wall beyond the lateral border of the pectoralis minor, and the latissimus dorsi is occupying the almost posterior part of the of the chest wall. The this the head of the patient is obviously on the on the on the on the left side or the upper left side. Okay, so that gives you a rough idea of how how uh, local anesthetic are going to be put in these planes. Okay. Now, as you do further this section, you can probably see on the right side of the screen is that's the uh, long thoracic nerve. The idea of putting highlighting that is 
the long thoracic nerve as well as the thoracodorsal nerve lie on top of the serratus anterior. The, ser the long thoracic nerve just lies maybe a little bit more anteriorly, which you can probably see more easily. The thoracodorsal nerve, which is far more posteriorly, lies between the serratus anterior and the uh, LD uh, which it supplies. Then the other nerve that you can very clearly see is the intercostal brachial, which is sort of coming below this lateral border of the pectoralis minor muscle or below the pectoralis major, uh, pectoralis muscle basically. It comes below the pectoralis major and minor group of muscles. So again, putting if I put a, a ultrasound probe on this position, which is go was going to be the pectoral block, which is going to be the interpectoral. So I'm going to put local anesthetic in this position between the pectoralis major and minor, which becomes the interpectoral block. If well, I my uh, so basically that is going to be catching either the medial and the lateral pectoral nerve. If I'm going to put my probe here, I'm going to be seeing the lateral edge of both the pectoral muscles, and I'm going to see the ribs, and I'm going to see the serratus anterior, which is sitting on top of the ribs. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is when you're moving the probe from the pectoralis, you're trying to scan the pectoralis major, then the pectoralis minor, then you come on to the lateral border of the pectoralis major and minor. And as you start seeing the lateral border you, of these two muscles, you'll start seeing a thin slip of serratus anterior coming into view. As the serratus, as you move your probe further down, you're going to see the serratus anterior only on top of the ribs between the lateral edge of the pectoralis muscles and before the LD starts. So the nomenclature will change as you go from interpectoral to pectoserratus to superficial or deep serratus depending on where you put the local anesthetic. Now you can also see that depending on where you put the local anesthetic, how your nerves are going to be affected and what sort of block is going to help you with what sort of incision. So again, if I do the same picture on this, this uh, uh, um, um, live or maybe on a patient as such. So if I'm going to put, assume that the pectoralis major is not, re not reflected back. So if I put the, the probe there where uh, I would probably do uh, similar to what I would put for an in, um, uh, infraclavicular nerve block. The nerve, the uh, probe position is probably going to be there. So you know that when I put local anesthetic, it's going to be between these, these, this muscle. Normally, you would, when you're doing a, a interpectoral nerve block, you want to look at or try and find the pectoral branch or the thoracoacromial artery because that's a landmark which shows that you're in the right plane, but sometimes you can't see it. Uh, when you put local anesthetic in the in the exact plane, the plane just unzippers or starts opening off and you know you're in the right plane. Whereas if you put it intramuscular, you know the, the it starts distorting the muscle. So as I go down, I'm going to see again the lateral edge of this pectoralis major and minor muscles. And then I'm going to start seeing the start of the, the serratus anterior muscle. And between as I move more laterally, before I meet the LD, I'm going to see only serratus anterior and the ribs. And I'm going to see the pleura below. So that's what my probe position is going to be. So when I'm going to put local anesthetic here, you're going to have between the pectoralis major and minor becomes the interpectoral nerve block. When I put local anesthetic there, it's going to be either a, a you know, pex2 block, which is going to be between the pectoralis minor and the serratus anterior. Or you can also call it, if you have enough local anesthetic, it can be a superficial serratus uh, plane block. If you put it below the serratus, then it's going to be a deep serratus plane block. In the original description or many a description as such, you will find that the definition of the serratus plane block actually says putting local anesthetic between the serratus anterior and the LD. So they say that to go between those planes, find the thoracodorsal artery and put local anesthetic between them. And if you put local anesthetic before that, then it's called as a serratus interfacial plane blocks. Again, if you leave nomenclature aside for a little while, you can understand that putting local anesthetic in the facial plane blocks and you know where the local anesthetic is going to act which on which nerves, then you probably don't need to fixate too much on the nomenclature. If you put local anesthetic here, you know that these nerves are going to be affected. If you put local anesthetic in this plane, these nerves are going to be affected and try not to fixate too much on the nomenclatures. Yes, it is important from from exam point of view, but from practical point of view, I think it's important that you all, you know, most of the anatomy and the facial planes and where the, the, the nerves run. Now, 
how does the sono anatomy look now if i'm going to move my probe from this position going down the axilla and then going down uh, further on to the chest wall what does it look like in terms of the sono anatomy picture so i'm going to sort of start off with that's the pectoralis major and minor which is the two main muscles in the front of the chest i'm starting to see these ribs and the glistening pleura as i come to the lateral <coughs> excuse me you can see i'm just going to pause it there we just passed the lateral edge of the uh, the the pectoralis muscle and i'm seeing that these are the ribs and the only muscle that is seen on top of the ribs is the serratus because i've still not gone posterior enough for me to see the LDA. So that's just the serratus anterior and I keep scanning down until you'll start seeing some sort of muscle which is going to come up somewhere here which is going to be the uh, latissimus dorsi. So once you know what the sonar anatomy looks like, once you know what the anatomy is now, you know what to expect and you can probably start appreciating there are two different muscles which look differently yes, uh, that yes. appear. So this is going to be a rib, this is going to be a serratus anterior and the, and the latissimus dorsi is already appeared here. So you know that if you're going to put a superficial serratus plane block, then you're going to put it in the plane between the LD and the serratus. If it is going to be deep, you're going to hit this rib and elevate the local, uh, elevate the serratus of the, the periosteum of the rib. Okay, now I'll quickly go a few videos on how the interpectoral, I think all of us have done those blocks, but still I'm going to do a quick video. So this is a pectoralis major, pectoralis minor, and the local anesthetic, if it's in the right plane, just opens the plane up and you know that you're in the right plane. Though I couldn't see the exact artery there, or the, 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 the facial plane was fairly good. Now uh, this is the pectoserratus. Now that's, I think probably the area of the third or the fourth rib, that's the pectoralis major, pectoralis minor, and the small slip of serratus which is coming along. Uh, that's my needle there. I'm putting some local anesthetic there. And you will find that this local anesthetic sort of starts seeping on top of the serratus and uh, underneath the pectoralis minor. So this becomes my pectoserratus block. Now, um, I know this this video is basically how uh, usually we try and do a, a deep serratus plane block. Now this is a little different from what the nomenclature says. As I said that the uh, technically the the serratus plane block says that you put local anesthetic deep to the serratus, but at the level of the at the where the LD is. But uh, normally what we have realized is most of our uh, our breast patients if they have uh, a LD flap done. Only then it makes worthwhile getting those nerves, which is a thoracodorsal nerve for the LD flap. But if it's if we are not going to go that far posteriorly, then uh, we have realized that putting local anesthetics that far posteriorly actually doesn't help that much. So we probably put it at the level of where before the LD is come. So anywhere between the lateral edge of the pectoralis major and the medial edge of the uh, the LD before the LD comes. So that's where we would sort of put local anesthetic either deep to the serratus. So this is hitting the periosteum of the rib and then infiltrating local anesthetic underneath the serratus. But obviously this is much before the LD has even appeared. And uh, then this is the parasternal block. This is just putting local anesthetic uh, at the level of just the costal cartilage or a little bit lateral to it below the uh, pectoralis major muscle. You can see the pleura uh, pretty much downstairs and putting some local anesthetic. Now, um, we also do a lot of these parasternal blocks. Uh, we are not yet still doing it for the, the cardiac surgery bit because our cardiac surgeon is still not convinced. But uh, we would do it quite, or we have to do it quite a lot for patients for breast surgery under purely blocks because we are like, realize that in spite of putting good paravertebral blocks, they always complain of a little bit of pain when the incision is very close to the midline which is probably because of supply from the opposite side. So we have realized putting few mils of local anesthetic just near the pect pectoralis major muscle where the incision is going to be helps uh, relieve that pain, especially when you're doing it just um, just under block. Now, I think this is a good summa summation by Dr. Amit Pawa about how your chest wall blocks cover in terms of how the paravertebral covers. I'll come to the paravertebral in a minute. But otherwise, the supraclaviculus, you put it some local anesthetic in the superficial cervical plexus. It covers most of this area around the clavicle and just below it. Your parasternal will cover sort of almost halfway through the midline, the mid-clavicular line. Your serratus is going to cover again your lateral part of the chest wall. Interpectoral and the pectoserratus will cover uh, majority of the lateral part of the upper part of the, the breast as well as your uh, intercostobrachial nerve, which is going to cover 
the axilla. So that's a good picture to have in terms of understanding where your, your incision is going to be, what block is needed, and if you put local anesthetic, what do you expect to be in terms of pain relief. This was to be a complicated sort of uh, a table, but now if you understand the anatomy, local, uh, the facial planes, which block, which nerves come from where, I think this complicated sort of makes it easy because you know now which nerve uh, can be blocked by which uh, uh, facial plane blocks. Now, quickly coming back to a little bit of uh, 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 blocks around the, the paravertebral area. So we know, looking at this picture again, you know that this is the spinous process, that's the transverse process. This group of muscle is the, the, the erector spinae uh, muscle that is supplied mainly by the dorsal ramus. Now putting local anesthetic below the erector spinae, just very close to the lamina becomes a retro laminar plane block. If you put it below the superior costo transverse ligament in the paravertebral region, it becomes a, you see, the paravertebral block. All of us know about the erector spinae plane block, which is putting local anesthetic at the level of the transverse process, but below the erector spinae uh, muscle. And the MTP block, which is basically midpoint from the transverse process to, this, uh, to the pleura, is basically putting local anesthetic just outside the superior costo transverse ligament. And intertransverse plane block, which is now sort of come into, uh, uh, I couldn't say vogue, but a lot of papers coming on that, that is putting local anesthetic between the two transverse processes below the intertransverse tissue complex is proving to be, or at least having some papers to show that it works as well as a paravertebral block, but there are papers to prove otherwise as well. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on, on thoracic paravertebral block because I think this is an important block in terms of getting your thoracic uh, analgesia as well as analgesia for multiple procedures and uh, uh, you know rib fractures and I think it's great to have knowledge and more so with the ultrasound I think it becomes a lot easier uh, nowadays and uh, I think it's it's good block to know and to practice so advantages I think I'm just going to spend too much time it contains spinal nerves white and gray rema it communicates with the sympathetic chain uh, it gives you a great ipsilateral segmental somatic sympathetic nerve blocks and that and the thoracic domatomes are continuous so you can if you put a good amount of local anesthetic you will realize that it spreads up and down how much it spreads is a matter of debate and i got a video to show how that works uh quickly to show how what the anatomy is i mean um, uh, you know anteriorly it's the uh, the, the pleura laterally that uh, the thoracic par paravertebral space tapers and it can as it continues as the intercostal space posteriorly from even the sonar anatomy point of view, your superior costal transverse ligament is your uh, uh, limiting factor on the posterior side. Medially, obviously, is your intervertebral foramen. Uh, superiorly is the inferior part of the rib head and, in, and inferior is the superior part of the rib head. Okay. Now, I'm going to sort of, this is the MRI picture on the left, which shows that's the body. That's the junction of the rib and the the transverse process. The same is with the CT. So that's your costo transverse sort of junction. So that's where uh, uh, the, the thing is pointing out. Now I've taken an MRI picture, which is uh, the first is the next one is an MRI picture. Okay, yeah. So coming back to this, this this is at the level of the rib junctioning with the transverse process. If you go a few millimeters down, that is the ribs have disappeared and that's a transverse process still in view, but that's the paravertebral space on an MRI. So you can see that's the that's the cross section that is taken and you can see sort of the whitish nerve root which is emerging from that. So that's the paravertebral space. So just to give you an anatomy of how that nerve root is going to emerge just below the the costal transverse uh, junction. That's the CT image as well. Again, a few millimeters down where to just to avoid the, the, the rip, uh, but at the same time, keep the transverse process in view. And that you can see sort of highlighted white nerve root that is arising from the intervertebral foramen. That's just to give you an idea about the CT and the MRI image. Now, I'm quickly going to run through. This is from, from paravertebral procedure point of view. You can do the patient with sitting lateral. You can put the probe in transverse or sagittal you can be in plane out of plane but too important to remember that the landmarks are the 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 transverse process the rib the pleura and the superior costal transverse ligament okay 
So if you look at it from the lateral side, that's the superior costo transverse ligament. Costo is attached to the rib transverse, is attached to the transverse process. That's the intertransverse ligament that is again nowadays in a lot of focus because this entire complex is now called as the intertransverse tissue complex and they're, and they're sort of studying quite a bit about it because they're realizing there are a little bit of gaps in these, these, um, uh, these uh, ligaments and that might help in seepage of the local anesthetic that is put around or un underneath these um, ligaments that help local anesthetic reach the paravertebral space. So if I want to do a, a, a paravertebral block, I can either put the, the probe uh, in line with the rib or I can put it in the parasagittal orientation. So I'm going to move that probe in that direction. So first put it on the rib and come a little bit lower down in the intercostal space to make sure that I see the rib, I see the pleura and I see the costotransverse ligament. The same I would do if I'm going to parasagittal orientation where I'm going to move it from the rib side because they are easy to identify. Then come a little bit more medial and then identify the transverse process and the superior costotransverse ligament. So how does that look on a on a on a sonar anatomy. So I've kept the started with that the, the horizontal where parallel to the rib. So I've kept it on the ribs. You can see that's the white hyperechoic area which depicts the rib and bone because there's nothing below it. And I'm going to move the probe a little bit medially and inferiorly to make sure that you identify what looks like a transverse process which is coming up on the left side. So I'm moving it a little bit medially and I'm moving it a little bit inferiorly. And you can start seeing this glistening pleura which is coming into view. So that's my transverse process. That's the glistening pleura. And if I stop it at that, that looks pretty much like the picture I have on the right side of the screen, which is the transverse process, the superior costal transverse ligament and the pleura. So if I'm going to do a paravertebral plane block in this probe position out of plane, my needle trajectory is going to come in that direction. I'm going to pierce the superior costal transverse ligament, which gives a great giveaway if you take a blunted needle. We usually use a 18 gauge epidural needle because that's great for giveaway. Sometimes these block needles are very sharp or spinal needles are very sharp. You can't really see or can't really feel the giveaways, and especially big patients and you, the angles are a little difficult. So it becomes a little difficult to see. Uh, the end point obviously is the, the drop of the pleura, which I'll show you what it looks like. If I come from in plane, that my needle trajectory is going to be like that. And I go and pierce the superior costal transverse ligament and uh, drop the pleura. In the parasagittal orientation, again, I'm moving from the ribs because they're easy to identify. So identification of the ribs to transverse process is important because then your local anesthetic deposition is not going to be correct if you don't find the transverse process. So I'm going to move again from the lateral to the medial side. So these are the ribs because the, the they are rounded and the pleura is easily seen. And as I, as I come medial, you can make out that the orient the, the, norm, the, the appearance has changed. It's become a little bit more flatter you can see the transition between the rib and the transverse process happening here. And I've purposely kept the lower edge of the probe on the rib. So you can see the difference between the transverse process and the rib. The reason being two is obviously you can identify the two. The other most important bit is if you're coming in plane, then the needle trajectory, which I'll show you on the right side of the screen. So that's the transverse process, superior costal transverse recommend and the rib. And if I'm going to do it out of plane, my needle trajectory is going to be in that direction. But if I'm going to come in plane, then if it is lying on both the transverse processes, then this needle trajectory becomes a little difficult. So it is just easier to rotate the lower part of your probe a little bit outward to make it lie on the rib. Then your needle trajectory is, is better. So uh, this is just a quick video of how the dropout of the pleura or drop down of the pleura looks when you enter this or pierce the superior costal transverse, sorry, superior costal transverse ligament. That's my needle and I'm coming in plane with a, a, a the probe orientation parallel to the rib. That's the superior costal transverse ligament. You can see when I inject local anesthetic, this pleura sort of drops down, which tells me that I've, in, that I've pierced the superior costal transverse ligament. And the end point of that procedure is drop down of the pleura. Now, we get a lot of questions and we used to think about if you're putting local anesthetic uh, about 10 mils in, an, in, in, one, in one segment or one place, what would be the, the the spread of a 10 mil local anesthetic? I know nowadays with the, with the ultrasound, you can sort of scan up and down and see, but we tried to capture the same through a thoracoscope from inside the chest. And so if I'm doing this procedure outside with a 10 mil of local anesthetic bolus done from outside, this is what it looks like from the inside. So we have tried to collect a video of how a thoracic paravertebral block looks 
when I put local anesthetic. So basically I'm on the other side of the chest wall. This is the surgeon looking at the uh, inside of the chest through a thoracoscope. And these on the lower part of the screen is what you can see is the indentations of the transverse processes. The, the lung is deflated down below. These are the ribs which are going across the screen on top of the screen. And I first pushed a test so you can see this pleura sort of ballooning up. And then once I put the local anesthetic of 10 mils, you can see how the spread happens. And the spread you can see happens in the, the area of least resistance. So you will find a little bit of local anesthetic going towards the towards the, the, the rib. But the point of making is a 10 ml local anesthetic bolus or 10 ml fluid bolus sort of gives you a roughly three to four levels up and down of the local anesthetic that you put in. This is about 10 mil uh, local anesthetic bolus. Now, this may not consistently happen all the time. We sort of checked it on a few other patients as well. Few have two, three areas of spread, two, three levels spread, few have more than that. So it, I think patient variability as well. It may be depending on how much pressure you put. I'm not sure about whether that is a factor as well. Now, <clears throat> A lot of uh, a talk now uh, in the literature has been going out about this intertransverse tissue complex. And I'm putting this purposely because when the erector spinae muscle plane block came into, uh, into, into practice, I think we had hundreds and hundreds of paper uh, uh, claiming that it causes as good pain relief as it causes as a paravertebral block does. Um, then came another uh, uh, few in the literature where, in fact, even Dr. Manoj Karmakar has written a review saying that uh, it is an RIP block. It is not going to work at all because maybe the only way it acts is by absorption of local anesthetic through the uh, through uh, systemic absorption. But as people have studied the, the area of the paravertebral block, they have, they have started to realize there are two, there are two important uh, changes or redefinition of the anatomy of the paravertebral space and most importantly what they call is is a medial slit and a lateral slit uh, around the superior costotransverse ligament and this is what is probably uh, helps or uh, is important for the local anesthetic to see through when you're putting local anesthetic in any of these paraspinal area blocks which is above the superior costal transverse ligament so either it's a it's an mtp block or it's an itp block or it's a retrolaminar or it, 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 it's a erector spinae plane block this slit these slits are helping local anesthetic seep through into the uh, uh, the paravertebral space and then give uh, anterior analgesia as well as uh, you know as dense anesthesia because of sympathetic nerve involvement uh, like a paravertebral block does. Obviously, there are more studies coming into it, but this is what the recent sort of anatomical changes has been in terms of uh, the paraspinal blocks, blocks and their affection in terms of good pain relief, uh, almost comparable to a paravertebral block. Coming to ESP, I think I, I don't need, you don't need me to tell you how to perform an ESP. ESP is one of the, the, the simplest of blocks, but the key to doing an ESP, ESP block is basically identifying the transverse process, because if you're not on the transverse process, you can be more medial to it, which is fine, because then it becomes a lateral laminar plane block, at least from the position of the correct plane of local anesthetic. But if you're going to go too lateral, then either you're going, not going to be on the on the, on the the transverse process, especially on the, when you're on the, the lumbar bit, bit and you're going to be on the ribs if it's going to be on the uh, on the thoracic levels. So I'm just going to have a quick video of how the the, the transition looks on it on a uh, this on the left side of the screen is a, a linear probe, and this is more on the on the thoracic uh, spine level where you can see the I'll play this video back. It's the transition is happening from the midline or just close to the midline and then going a little bit more lateral and you can see how the transition and the sonatomy picture looks. But this is just near the intertransverse uh, 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 intertransverse gap. You can see that gap here. And as the transverse, as the probe moves medially, you can see the, the transverse process. You can see these transverse processes with a little flat. And as the probe four goes, and you can't see the pleura. And the pleura then comes into view because which tells me that I'm fairly fairly lateral and I'm actually on the ribs and not really near the transverse process. I think that is important to identify, especially from ESP point of view. The same that you, if you could see in the lumbar area, this is a curved linear probe, a curvy linear probe. You can see in this, this is a parasagital oblique orientation where you can see sort of the 
lamina and interlaminar space and you can see the posterior complex there and that's the anterior complex and that's the spinal fluid or the, the spinal cord area. And as the probe moves from medial to lateral side, you can appreciate that this is becoming a continuous um, where the lamina is complete and then it comes back and shows the threshold sign or the trident sign, which is basically your transverse process. So that is again important to identify. So just a quick video of the erector spinae plane block. I think it's, it's fairly, fairly simple. You just hit the transverse process. And if you're a muscular, so you can see the first injection is intramuscular, but the second injection comes nicely onto the plane. And you can see that the plane, once you find the plane, it sort of just peels off the, the muscle from the, uh, the attachment and the spread is good. This is just a five mil bolus. You can see it sort of went off two, three levels in front of the, the local and in front of the uh, uh, point of injection. And you know that it covers uh, a fair bit. And you can see that when you scan up and down to see how your local anesthetic has spread. Quick journal review, <clears throat> prospect guidelines. Uh, again, from, uh, from exam point of view, I think it's important to know what prospect is and what prospect guidelines are. Though in the recent future, depending on what they have recommended, especially from obstetrics point of view, it's not been very popular. But still, I think they have, they come up with good guidelines. You don't necessarily follow it to the T, but it's it's a good sort of rough guide to have it along. So from from um, uh, breast uh, surgery point of view, from minor breast surgery, they're not really recommending any blocks as such. They said local anesthetic is good enough, but from major breast surgery point of view, in addition to you know dexamethasone and your usual stuff, they're recommending the paravertebral block, uh, the pes pex block. Again, this is a little earlier than the nomenclature came off. So uh, if no axillary node dissection, then this apex block or maybe a paravertebral block is contraindicated. Local anesthetic infiltration is something that they, they uh, also recommend. This is another sort of study which says that a continuous paravertebral plane block versus uh, plus a serratus plane block had a high probability of reducing pain uh, at 24 hours after major oncobreast surgery. Uh, we all know about the benefits of local anesthetic uh, in breast surgeries. Obviously, there are opioid spurring. That's the reason for doing it. They reduce POINV. Chronic pain is something that uh, uh, is an important part, especially from thoracoscopy, thoracotomy, and uh, chronic um, uh, breast pain point of view. Whether it just reduces risk of cancer, we're not sure. There are a lot of papers which show for and against it. What, what does prospect say about video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery? Uh, again, they say paravertebral block is great and they probably recommend it more than anybody else. Uh, erector spinae plane block you can do. Serratus plane block is good. Uh, that's what they say about the VAT surgery point of view from thoracotomy, which is an open open surgery. They say if you can't do any regional anesthetic, obviously an opioid is great. But if you can, again, paravertebral block with local anesthetic done preoperatively or at least if not preoperatively at the end of the surgery. And if you can put in a catheter is great. They recommend it over thoracic epidurals because of the complication rate. I think from our center point of view, we do a lot of thoracic uh, paravertebral area for a lot of reasons. We used to do uh, the, uh, the vertebral um, epidurals first, but invariably you go to the ICU and if there is a blood pressure issue and the first thing they stop is the the, the, the thoracic paravertebral and the whole, the whole effort of the patient undergoing the thoracic epidural, you doing it. It just nullifies and whereas the thoracic paravertebrals are great you tell them that it's not going to have any too much effect on the hemodynamics is unilateral and uh, i think they they have a good point of uh, argument to do it more than the thoracic epidurals um if uh, yeah the thoracic epidural is the other one that they, they recommend that's a recent papers now because i was talking about the intertransverse uh process uh, plane block which is basically Again, sort of similar in terms of the, the the plane, which is basically put at the, just below the erector spinae plane block, but it is put below the intertransverse ligament. And what they're trying to say is that sort of seeps because of these, uh, the gaps, the medial slate, the lateral slate, and the gaps between the, the ligaments, there is a spread of local anesthetic anteriorly, anteriorly in the spread, in the, towards the paravertebral space to catch both the, uh, the sympathetic as well as the ventral ramus and the, and the dorsal ramus. And maybe that's something that we have to wait for. But the point of putting this is you can see there are two papers which all both of them 2024 and show exactly the opposite. The first one says that following major reconstructive breast surgery, pre-operative multi-injection ITP block did not reduce 24-hour opioid consumption. So they didn't find much. Whereas 
The other one says that based on the results, no, this is a cadaveric and that's actually from patient point of view. Um, local anesthetic spread following an ITP block extends to both the paravertebral space and the erector spinae facial plane block and thus may offer a more favorable analgesic profile than an EST block. So, both in a way. Just a few quick uh, um, articles. Uh, I'll just quickly run through. There is in 2020 erector spinae plane block and a thoracic paravertebral block for breast surgery compared to <coughs> sorry, IV morphine and they say that um, uh, have an opioid, both have an opioid sparing effect by reducing morphine, morphine uh, consumption. This is <clears throat> again 2020. They say ultrasound guided multiple injection paravertebral block proves superior to intercostal plane block. I think that's fairly simple. And when inj single injection erector spinal plane block, when an intercostal plane block and a single injection were equally affecting, reducing pain after the thoracostal. Can we find out? Yes, ma'am. So these are few studies. Uh, nothing much. That is just how the. Uh, I'm just going to say. Do a pre-op scan, dynamic scan, and helps. Uh, you just want to identify normal. Be aware of the artifacts. An isotropy, hydro dissection is important. Facial giveaways, small aliquots. Always use emergency drugs. Surgical analysis, your preoperative analysis is something that you need to decide. Then you know to know how much medication, how uh, and the concentration. You need to be procedure specific, site specific, opioid sparing. And chest wall blocks are good if you don't want to do you know, thoracic walls from an analgesic point of view. And there are large volume blocks. So toxic dose has to be watched. Combination always helps. Whether they act also by systemic absorption, we don't know. Always do a risk benefit. Anxiolysis is something that we always follow. So if you have to do a no, uh, if you have to do a uh, surgery here or here or here or here, you, if you know the anatomy, then you would know probably which block to do. Thank you. So that was an excellent talk by Dr. Harshil Vag, and uh, uh, I think he has very clearly uh, talked about all the blocks, and he kept saying try not to fixate much on the nomenclature. So if you just understand the anatomy and know where to put your local anesthetic between two facial planes, uh, it's not so difficult. And Harshil has shown very beautiful pictures and videos about the drug spreading in a nice plane. But practically, I tell you, when you're new, especially you will put some drug into the muscle. You will have some adhesions in the fascia and the drug spread may not be very even. So don't get discouraged. Continue doing them. It's important to continue doing these things. And... Uh, uh, I think uh, we won't talk much, but uh, I have uh, Viral who will conduct a small quiz on thoracic uh, uh, chest wall blocks before we go on to the abdominal blocks. Over to Viral. Thank you, madam. So for all the participants, we'll be having a small interactive quiz. Uh, there will be 10 MCQs and you have to select one right answer. And you will be five minutes. And after submitting your answers, you'll be able, uh, you'll be uh, able to see the right, correct answers also. So I'll be sharing them. So I'm just starting the thoracic wall blocks quiz now. I hope everyone is able to see. Yes, we can see. Sure. So everyone has to select their answer and swipe either left or right. You will be given ten or five minutes for ten questions.
anyone has any other questions, you can put it in the chat box. It will be answered at the end of the session. Last two minutes. I think five minutes are done. I'm uh, ending the quiz now. I hope maximum participants must have submitted their answers. And I'll be sharing the results soon. I think all of you are able to see your marked answer and also the correct answer for the particular question. Right, madam? Yeah, I think so. You can tell the answer. Yeah. So for first question, uh, uh, the correct answer is the uh, serratus anterior and latissimus dorsi. The serratus main block involves installation of local anesthetic between. The second question. So all of the following nerves are blocked in PEX2, except the correct answer is rhipodorsal nerve. But the third question, artery which runs between internal and interpostal and transverse thoracic is the internal thoracic artery. Innovation to the chest wall is from all of the uh, above, the brachial plexus, intercostal, and the superficial cervical plexus. For the fifth question, all of the following are regarding ultrasound guided thoracic paravertebral. The correct answer is all of the above are true. The lung slide sending sign is indicative of pneumothorax. That is a false answer. All of the following are correctly matched for a critical uh, bony landmark, except the correct answer is paravertebral and block and spinous process because it's a transverse process. Seventh question, all of the following forms the boundaries of uh, thoracic paravertebral space except the correct answer is the spinous process. Following nerves are blocked in parasternal chest wall blocks. The correct answer is anterior branch of intercostal nerves. And for the posterior chest wall blocks, all of the following are except the pecto intercostal facial plane block. The arterial pulsations which can be seen in the 
So while giving Pike's block, the correct answer is Rako Acrobial Army. So I think uh, we can continue the session further, madam. Yeah. So uh, why this enthusiasm for epidurals has waned? It's because of increasing number of non-invasive procedures, aggressive post-operative anticoagulation, emphasis on early ambulation, and introduction of simple and less complicated blocks. And the number of complications also have gone down. But I'll tell you with all this block, one thing we should keep in our operation theater is the intra lipid in case you have to face last. Now, to speak on the abdominal blocks, we have none other than Dr. Amit Dixit. He is consultant and status at the Ruby Hall Clinic Pune. He is a course lead for Regional Anesthesia Fellowship Program. The member of Board of Studies for Fellowship and Research for Eura. He is a peer reviewer for IJA and a part of team for organizing workshops on focus, fate, and regional anesthesia. Over to you, Dr. Amit Dixit. Yeah, thank you very much, madam. Uh, at the outset, uh, I'm really grateful to Dr. Amla, madam, uh, Dr. Yogita, madam, Dr. Kane, madam, and the whole of ISA uh, team. Uh, excellent talk by my good friend, Dr. Harshal. Uh, uh, what I have planned is uh, I, I'll be discussing the clinical tips and pearls uh, uh, with all these blocks. So I have a recorded uh, lecture of 15 minutes on quadratus lumborum and uh, rem because it's a little, uh, uh, you know, block which requires little more attention. So I'm covering this aspect first and then I will be giving tips on other blocks as well in another 15 minutes. So that is our plan. So let us start. So this is another uh, landmark article. Uh, those of us who are interested in quadratus lumborum block must go through this article, which is published in Anesthesiology Journal in February 2019. So, a little bit about the nomenclature of QL1, 2, 3, and 4. When the drug is deposited on the lateral aspect of quadratus lumborum in the fascia transversalis, it is called as QL1 block or lateral QL. When the drug is deposited, I'll, I'll show you with a laser pointer. Uh, when the drug is deposited on the posterior aspect of quadratus lumborum at the lateral edge of erector spiny, it is called as posterior QL block. And when the drug is deposited between the quadratus lumborum and source major, this is on the anterior aspect of quadratus lumborum. So it is called anterior QL block or QL3. Now, a uh, little bit about the thoracolumbar fascia. We have three facial, the thoracolumbar fascia divides into three as anterior, middle, and posterior layer. The anterior layer, as you can see, it covers the anterior aspect of quadratus lumborum. The middle layer covers the posterior aspect of quadratus lumborum. And then we have posterior layer, which is encircling around the erector spiny muscle. So the drug deposition is in and around the thoracolumbar fascia. And there was this group from Beijing, which mentioned that the integrity of thoracolumbar fascia, and more importantly, the integrity of fascia transversalis, uh, it is necessary for success of QL3 block. So the important tip while performing QL3 or anterior QL is we have to do needling more towards the transverse process side and needle should not uh, go laterally. Uh, to the breach in fascia transversalis or breach in anterior layer of thoracolumbar fascia, it can cause spillage of drug in the peritoneal cavity or in the, you know, uh, the fatty layer of kidney or geortas fascia and it can lead to inadequate action of block. So, QL1, the drug is deposited on the lateral aspect of quadratus lumborum. And uh, here, as I can show you, the external oblique, the internal oblique, and the transversus abdominis. And the needle is piercing the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis. And the drug is deposited in the transversalis fascia 
and it is on the lateral aspect of quadratus lumborum so it is also known as a uh, lateral ql this is similar to fascia transversalis block described by dr hebert and because the drug is deposited in the transversalis fascia it has got a visceral component of pain relief other than the somatic component so now coming to the um, posterior ql or ql2 block which is another interesting block here the drug is deposited on the in in the lift area which is the lumbar interfacial triangle so cadaveric dissection studies showed that there are no nerves here and this is a dense facial area uh, so as we were discussing with uh, dr rafael blanco who discovered this block he shared his view that the abdominal cavity or the abdominal hole of abdomen can be compared with a dense electric net and this lift area probably is the switch button and if we deposit the local anesthetic in this area it can lead to some sort of a short circuit of whole abdomen and it produces dense analgesia or whole abdomen so if we are doing a bilateral ql2 or a posterior QL block, then it produces dense analgesia all over the abdomen. And this is the similar cl clinical experience in our um, institution also. Uh, additional tip is uh, when we are depositing the drug in the lift area, we can move the needle a little bit posteromedially and deposit some amount of drug in that area as well. So here, as we can see the uh, the internal oblique and uh, the transversus abdominis muscle have become aponeurotic to form a lateral raphe which splits into two lamina to form a lumbar interfacial triangle and the drug has to be deposited on the posterior aspect of quadratus lumborum at the lateral edge of the erector spine. Uh, uh, some amount of drug is also allowed to go in the posteromedial direction. So I'll be, this, this block is, uh, I usually tend to prefer it in lateral position, but it can be done in supine position with a little wedge uh, or some support under the hip area. And the preferred proof for this block is linear proof because with linear proof, we can very uh, easily see the spread of drug. And this is how Dr. Rafael Blanco is also uh, doing this block. Uh, with the help of a linear probe mm -hmm. so uh, if you are um, you know you want better success i think the linear probe is the key and what we see here is uh, i'll show you this is a very quick short video and um, you can clearly see the quadratus lumborum. We can see the lateral edge of erector spiny, and this is the lift area. So there is no rocket science here. Not much of skill set required. We just have to bathe whole of the 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 lift area, and we have to just so around 15-20 mils of local anesthetic in the lift area, and then in the needle is advanced posteromedially to allow the drug spread in the posteromedial direction between erector spinae and quadratus lumborum. So total around 25 to 30 mils of local anesthetic produces very good dense analgesia. So this was our patient who has undergone laparoscopic. Uh, surgery and this is the port site incision and this is immediately after surgery so there was no local infiltration at port site and you can see how dense analgesia we have achieved and even on squeezing the surgical incision there is not much of pain so it is always desirable to check the action of block at the end of the block maybe after half an hour or so when the block action has taken up and we, are, we can expect a good quality of analgesia. Coming to the another important uh, type of block, which is described by Professor Borglum, and this is anterior quadratus lumborum or transmuscular quadratus lumborum or TQL block, also known as tequila block. And here the drug is deposited between the swas muscle and the 
quadratus lumborum muscle so in between swass and quadratus lumborum here on the anterior side we see many nerves and the drug is deposited over the thoracolumbar fascia and what is the mechanism of action is we can see that as the drug is deposited the drug tends to ascend up along the thoracolumbar fascia it moves cranially through medial and lateral arcuate ligaments of diaphragm and it can uh, it, it has his all its action because of indirect paravertebral uh, spread so this has been proved with cadaveric dissection studies so if we are doing a block at l3 l4 level it produces analgesia up to t4 and uh, this is this is really nice so only important aspect is we have to keep our needle more towards the transverse process side and do not allow it to go towards the uh, the geortas fascia or the renal pad of fat so uh, this this whole area and the depositing so uh, the drug between the the uh, the, uh, the quadratus lumborum and the swas major so this is the area which i am interested and this is for my um, anterior ql so is it is it that simple i mean just opening this interfacial plane is is it that in is that the end of the story i think no it's a little technically challenging block because we need to understand you now this was our ql3 catheter and this was a case of open nephrectomy and uh, as we can see once the surgeon has uh, done the surgical incision and there was a big rent in the thoracolumbar fascia and our catheter is popping in the surgical field so where exactly we should deposit the drug so we have quadratus lumborum and we have swas major muscle in between is the thoracolumbar fascia so drug has to be deposited between the epimysium of quadratus lumborum and the thoracolumbar fascia so position one is the correct one now if we overshoot the target and if we cause breach in the continuity of thoracolumbar fascia then our and our needle has gone still further in the swas area then it works more like a swas compartment block and uh, lumbar uh, area so instead of drug ascending up higher up up to t4 it tends to move down and this also has been proved with cadaveric studies so uh, there some amount of dexterity is required while performing this block we can use pns and keep the current on 0.3 milliampere current and if we see a local twitch of quadratus lumborum or swas muscle local twitch then we should not be depositing the drug once we are exactly in the plane then there will not be any local twitch and we can deposit the drug so uh, the correct placement can be achieved by uh, as the needle is advancing through the quadratus lumborum muscle we have to do hydro dissection gentle needling and we try to achieve the the end point which is between the epimysium of quadratus lumborum and the thoracolumbar fascia so uh, this is uh, some uh, these are some of the challenges while performing this block and we are uh, doing this block in lateral position usually the preferred uh, approach is the shamrock approach we all know the shamrock leaf and the shamrock sign and or the thumbs up sign and this is uh, one of our scanning video now here we are using a curvilinear probe and what we see here is the quadratus lumborum muscle the transverse process and the swas muscle and we have to deposit the drug as uh, the needle is coming and advance it further we can see it now more nicely the interfacial plane between the quadratus lumborum and the swas and here also we have to do hydro dissection gently more towards the transverse process side and we should not allow any spillage of drug or breach in continuity of transverse alis fascia or the anterior thoracolumbar fascia the drug should not uh, be allowed to move in this direction so the needle can come either in plane or out of plane more towards the transverse process side and the drug is deposited between the epimysium of quadratus lumborum and the thoracolumbar fascia so uh, that's all about the drug spread now there is another variant called as subcostal quadratus lumborum block and 
this can be done in sitting position and this is nothing but a variant of ql3 block and here the drug uh, here the probe is placed in parasagittal position uh, near the transverse process uh, the patient is in sitting position this can be done pre-operatively we can use out of plane technique and uh, the view is similar but it uh, here we can see the quadratus lumborum muscle and the psoas muscle and the drug is deposited in between two so uh, bilateral block in sitting position just before surgery produces dense analgesia um, for whole of uh, laparoscopic surgeries so just the comparison between anterior and posterior ql so anterior QL requires some amount of dexterity as where the needle tip has gone and it should not overshoot the target. The integrity of thoracolumbar fascia and the fascia transfer cells is necessary. And we are using curvilinear probe and we should be careful about needling and should be near the transverse process, uh, more towards the transverse process side. Uh, posterior QL, here the drug is deposited at the lateral edge of erector spiny on the posterior aspect of quadratus lumborum. This is like a switch button. There is not much of rocket science. Needling skill set required is not much because we just have to bathe the lift area and allow some amount of posteromedial spread between the erector spiny and the quadratus lumborum. So both uh, blocks will have around 25 to 30 ml of local anesthetic. And both blocks are promising for all laparoscopic surgeries, for all laparotomies, when we have operated spine or something where we cannot put epidural, these blocks are comparable with that of epidural. When it comes to lateral QL, the, the, the efficacy is limited to T12 and L1 area. So it is useful for all uh, uh, elective C-sections and open myomectomies. Now we have to use linear probe for QL1 and QL2 and curvilinear probe for QL3. Another important thing is whenever we perform QL block, it is always bilateral. Uh, if the surgery is laparoscopic surgery, we have to do a bilateral block. Uh, I have seen some of my residents, they said that the uh, patient has undergone lap cholecystectomy, so we'll do a unilateral block for lap col. I think that is not a good idea. And these are all interfacial plane blocks, so it depends on volume. So we should be using uh, modest dosages and to have the better efficacy. Thank you very much for patient hearing. Yeah, thank you. So that was a quick uh, go through for quadratus lumborum block. And we had discussion on quadratus lumborum block uh, before as well uh, with uh, uh, with all the eminent uh, faculties. And um, what we have uh, realized is uh, mm, uh, though the say uh, what Dr. Uh, Rafael Blanco has mentioned is uh, even though we do not have uh, any nerves for explanation of mechanism of action for uh, QL2, uh, but still uh, uh, it can be explained. So he, what he has mentioned is we have uh, wasted uh, many years uh, only on um, uh, what he, he mentioned is we are looking for nerves all the time. And that may not be the case. Uh, just a minute. Give me a minute. I'm just starting with another presentation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, we it is it is good to learn how uh, researchers are thinking. And I was fortunate to interact with Professor Rafael Blanco. And every time he, he mentioned that for five years, we are looking for nerves all the time. And sometimes it may happen that interfacial plane blocks, the exact mechanism is not known. Uh, it can be because of systemic absorption of drug. The, the mechanism of action can be at molecular level. Anatomy will tell us only the half of the truth. So uh, because I am doing this block uh, very regularly, so I know that posterior QL does act and anterior and posterior QL are very efficacious uh, uh, and uh, research is still continuing. So as a clinician, we, we have this endpoint that yes, they are, they are useful blocks. 
so uh, that was all about quadratus lumborum quadratus lumborum uh, is a block of regional anesthetist uh, it's a it's a very uh, 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 satisfying block i should say whenever we have done this block for uh, with lot of effort uh, either posterior ql or anterior ql patients have good amount of satisfaction and uh, it was uh, as good as epidural um, when rest of the blocks uh, either it is tab block sap block uh, or rectus sheet block other blocks when we have used they are causing a dent on vascor uh, but uh, nothing like ql so of course uh, it covers the visceral component very well so without wasting much of time uh, we'll come to the overall discussion little later uh, some disclosures i have used nisora images uh, good books to read are hadzik musculoskeletal ultrasound by manoj karmakar cousins netters anatomy multiple websites youtube videos uh, photos and videos uh, which i am showing are with permission i am really grateful to all the colleagues and ra fellows from my department so my department has three regional anesthesia sites those of you who are interested can join us we have five dedicated ultrasound machine we do lot of point of care ultrasound as well so uh, somebody was talking uh, today uh, evening that is it necessary that we should learn these interfacial plane blocks probably uh, uh, it is very difficult to convince um, i should say those who are into freelancing practice because most of these uh, interfacial plane blocks are meant for uh, post op analgesia so as harshal has mentioned as you grow in regional anesthesia Uh, some specific cases will come to you just like for example uh, when it is upper trunk block you, you, uh, the surgeons will come to you that uh, can we do this breast surgery exclusively under surgical anesthesia with block uh, or vats under block similarly for lower abdomen it is hernia under block we got patient shifted from mumbai just for hernia surgery because patient has multiple issues spinal or epidural or ga was more or less not possible so uh, these are some of the uh, you know uh, very good cases you end up doing uh, another advantage is uh, multimodal analgesia already uh, harshal has highlighted so all these blocks we have to use multimodal analgesia because whenever there is any skin incision it causes release of uh, histamine bradykinin substance p leukotriene prostaglandins and as uh, you understand the physiology it causes a sensitizing soup which affects the white dynamic range in neuron and you know all the pain pathway through spinothalamic tract and pain memory so to cause dent on that not only block but we have to block all these channels uh, all the uh, at different different levels so you can understand here Uh, the role of multimodal analgesia and if we can achieve this i think uh, we'll be able to prevent pain chronicization sometimes residents do ask me uh, sir uh, we have done the case under spinal why should we give nsaids and paracetamol and local infiltration so uh, there is good evidence textbook evidence to suggest that we should be using all these medications now uh, so the buzzword or if somebody is asking where the regional anesthesia is progressing so day by day we are moving towards uh, local infiltration analgesia now we have exparel uh, liposomal bupivacaine we are more and more into site specific regional and peripheral blocks uh, it's opioid sparing it is motor sparing just like how we have adductor canal and ipac which is motor sparing site specific when surgery is on one limb why to block other limb and cause a uh, insensate limb procedure specific so the plan for best breast analgesia is different versus thoracotomy it is completely different and multimodal is necessary because it prevents pain chronicization even cancer recurrence one or two uh, some uh, encouraging studies are also there now what is most important uh, uh, aspect we have to understand are that there are limitations of interfacial plane block when we are doing a peripheral nerve block we are depositing local anesthetic over a peripheral nerve whereas interfacial plane block we are opening up that compartment and we expect all the nerves in that facial plane to uh, bathe to get covered and you know we we want uh, them uh, to act uh, 
and we really don't know how the interfacial plane uh, uh, really work because it depends upon how much volume you have used what concentration what was the needle trajectory and whether you have opened the plane correctly or not and then the mechanism of action is it is it is, uh, sometimes it is indirect para vertebral or we may end up uh, local anesthetic has uh, is uh, involving either uh, like thoracolumbar fascia or sometimes it could be fascia transversalis or some nerves in the, those areas so uh, peripheral nerve block can cause paralysis it is useful for surgical anesthesia whereas interfacial plane blocks are meant for post op analgesia only so if i am doing a brachial plexus block or a spinal block or an epidural block vascore can come down from 9 to 0 whereas with interfacial plane block if the vascore has come from 9 to just 5 it is still a very effective block and that is what we have to understand. Otherwise, most of the time uh, people say uh, we have done a tab block, we have done a sap block and patient is still having pain because we cannot use the mindset of assessment of a peripheral nerve block to that of a into that to a interfacial plane block. These are two different entities. And if we can understand that, then I think uh, we will understand how uh, interfacial plane blocks are working. So, uh, for a thoracotomy, if you have done a thoracic epidural, which is working very well, it can bring VAS score to zero if it is congruously placed. With an interfacial plane block, whatever block you use, VAS score may come from 9 to 5. It is bringing, it is creating some dent. It is still a very successful interfacial plane block. Now, we are in the era of ERAS. So, interfacial plane blocks do have role. Uh, it can be used in hemodynamically unstable patient. So if you read Cousins and Bredenbow, it has mentioned that hemodynamically unstable patient, patients with borderline coagulation issues, patient with mild infection, blocks can be done with the discretion of concerned anesthesiologist. And I think most of us, uh, you know, have done TAP block, ESP block, uh, local infiltration, and uh, we, we got away with these cases and we have avoided epidural in them and all deep seated blocks. So interfacial plane blocks are really beneficial to provide post-op analgesia. Sometimes patients with raised serum creatinine or multiple allergies or history of spine surgery. Again, uh, this is very useful tool which can be utilized. Other areas is on arrival block, say ESP block for fracture rib or SAP block for fracture rib or it can be a rescue block. Suppose epidural has come out in, uh, in on a ward round, we, we could see that it is difficult now to uh, reinstitute and all that. Or uh, we have utilized uh, these blocks like ESP, SAP, in MRI also in some patients, uh, in patients with cath lab and ICU and other remote locations. So um, now coming to dermatome, myotome and visceral component, uh, Herschel has mentioned that there are multiple challenges when it comes to thoracic blocks. So it's uh, it's not only T2 to T6, but there is, uh, as he has mentioned, long thoracic nerve, then the all those uh, medial and lateral pectoral, then also the nerve to serratus anterior, all these uh, uh, are the elements of brachial plexus. So when we talk about breast analgesia, it is uh, brachial plexus plus thoracic. So, lot many dermatomes to cover. Now, fortunately, we do not have that much of challenge when it comes to abdominal area. And we have T6 to L1 area, which needs to be addressed. So, it's dermatomal innervation and also then the visceral component. So, these are the nerves, how they are arranged from T7, 8, 9, 10. And then iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal. So when we talk about analgesia, we if it is say upper abdomen, then most commonly uh, what we do is uh, either a, a subcostal tap. If it is an near midline paraumbilical hernia, midline incision, then rectus sheet block. Tap block will cover more of a lower abdominal area. So we are really worried when the surgical incision is somewhere in the upper abdomen because it will affect respiration. Now the important block which has helped us uh, and those are like quadratus lumborum 2 and ql2 and 3 
that is posterior and anterior or uh, posterior and transmuscular quadratus lumborum block so they will have visceral component of pain relief as well uh, in contrast to rectus and tap and uh, also the ql1 for all those c sections uh, more uh, efficacious uh, versus when compared with tap so this is uh, these are some of the block strategies uh, so sometimes patient may have very big incision uh, we have placed an epidural to cover say uh, T6 to T10 and the lower area maybe we have uh, we could utilize a combination of either QL uh, blocks or ESP block. So this is how we can have a permutation combination. Now Herschel has nicely highlighted and everyone must know the course of intercostal nerve, the ventral and dorsal rami and how it winds around in the intercostal groove. And then uh, somewhere at mid axillary line where it gives a branch called lateral cutaneous branch. Now the key important clinical uh, pearl here is unless we are aware of this anatomy. So if we are doing a tap block anterior to uh, say mid axillary line, then probably we may miss uh, this nerve and it will cause patchy action. So therefore, if we know that we have to cover this lateral branch, which is more or less near the mid axillary line. So we have to do blocks either at mid axillary line or posterior axillary line. Then only it will cover the anterior cutaneous branch. Now, uh, anteriorly, when it comes uh, near, say, rectus sheath, there we have anterior divisions. Uh, so these are covered by rectus sheath block. So the course of uh, nerves, uh, the the intercostal nerves and uh, everyone must know. So some landmark blocks which, which can be done without ultrasound are definitely the ESP block, the serratus anterior plane block, just hitting the rib at that level, uh, even the external oblique interfacial plane block, which I'll be discussing later, and the intercostal block. These will provide good analgesia. here. So at mid axillary line, the intercostal nerve gives rise to lateral cutaneous branch supplying the lateral aspect of abdomen. If we miss this, then that area will be missed. So I'm just going to highlight the clinical pearls here. I'm just showing two or three important aspects. What, what is the nerve which is getting covered? So when we are talking about lateral tap, it covers T12 L1 dermatomes preferably. L1 is not consistently blocked. The position of patient is like this. Try to push the probe downwards more in the on the posterior side and go and perform the block preferably at the mid axillary line or even posterior. So this is the sono anatomy where we see external oblique, internal oblique and transverse abdominis. And the drug here is deposited. Uh, these are very good uh, diagrams from Nysora. They call it as reverse sono anatomy. So between internal oblique and transverse abdominis, the drug is deposited. Now to make this block more efficacious, we can just drag our probe even posteriorly and try to go even much more where, you know, the transverse abdominis has started becoming aponeurotic. And if we deposit in this area, this tap plane, this is called as posterior tap, or sometimes if we pierce the, uh, the aponeurosis of transverse abdominis, uh, or even if we deposit good amount of drug. So this is called as posterior tap or it is also known as fascia transversalis block or it is also known as lateral QL block. So because if we have deposited good amount of drug and done needling, the drug tends to diffuse in that area. So uh, once we have pierced the aponeurosis of transverse abdominis, then it becomes more of a lateral QL. So very difficult to exactly know whether we are pierced or not. So depositing good drug here will also help in causing the visceral component of pain relief. Now, what is the role of subcostal tap block? Now, as I was mentioning that the thing which will affect respiration is more important. So my priority is T6 to T8 area needs to be addressed up front. And for that, we have this option called as subcostal tap block. Now here you are you are able to see on the on the left side, uh, just in the subcostal area, the probe is placed and in plane needling is being done. Whereas in lateral tap, you can see the probe is between the iliac crest and the rib cage. 
so this is the patient position that's the uh, the left side is the the cephalid end and we have just placed the probe and we need to know something here is linea alba and the linea semilunaris linea semilunaris is the lateral extension of rectus abdominis and we need to know how the nerves are t7 t8 t9 t10 how they are coming and jetting from above so the clinical pearl here is in doing a subcostal tap block when the ipsilateral cutaneous innervation of t t6 to t7 these are medial to linea semilunaris and t9 to t10 are lateral to linea semilunaris so how so if we have done a medial injection medial then it will cover only t6 t7 just like i have shown that t6 t7 are medial to linea semilunaris and 9 and 10 are lateral so we have to do a spread in such a way at this junction now i'll explain with the sono anatomy like reverse sono anatomy as well so that's the rectus sheath and here are the three muscles so now the lateral edge of rectus sheath is the linea semilunaris so some drug must go medially and some drug must go laterally then only we will be able to uh, give justice and it will cause t6 t7 t8 t9 coverage so we have to be careful that open up this space nicely and it is in continuation with the tap space on the lateral side. So this is how it can be done very well. So ilioinguinal heliohypogastric, again, this is very useful block and it can be done near the ASIS. And what we need to know is ilioinguinal iliohypogastric, if it is blocked, it will consistently block the L1 dermatome, which sometimes can be missed with uh, lateral tap. So, skin over the inguinal area is definitely covered. So, this is how the ASIS and then we have uh, uh, external oblique, the bigger width of internal oblique and then the transversus abdominis. And in between is this, the ilioinguinal iliohypogastric nerve just near the ASIS and you can even see a vascular landmark, the dorsal uh, circumflex iliac artery. So, here we have to aspirate and inject. It is a tap block uh, in principle, but here we are specifically targeting the ilioinguinal iliohypogastric nerve. Sometimes you can use PNS also to just confirm it. And it is very useful block for all fenestial incisions. Rectus sheet block as uh, we were uh, discussing about the subcostal tap. Now here the rectus sheet block is done between midway between uh, the zip, uh, the ziphi sternum and the umbilicus. The above uh, the the end uh, here you can see where the drug is deposited. The end point is it is just between the posterior rectus sheath and the rectus muscle. Now why are we little? We have to be careful about this is as I have highlighted the vascularity here. We have superior epigastric artery and inferior epigastric artery and they are over the posterior rectus sheet. So we can use color Doppler, see to it that they are, uh, we are not causing any vascular puncture and deposit the drug. So here there are different linings. One is the rectus abdominis muscle. Then we have posterior rectus sheet and below that is the fascia transversalis. So we are not going into fascia transversalis. We are just depositing the drug between the epimyceum of rectus abdominis and the posterior rectus sheath. So drug will essentially lie on the posterior rectus sheath and uh, it will cover the, uh, the neuronal component. So this is the reverse sono anatomy diagram. And since it is not involving the fascia transversalis, uh, therefore, the tap and rectus sheath block will only cause somatic pain relief. They do not have any visceral component of pain relief. So, all periumbilical hernia, the nerve uh, is located between the rectus abdominis and the posterior rectus sheath. And here, as we remember the the uh, how the anterior cutaneous branch is uh, there and it provides innervation on the anteromedial uh, abdominal wall. Now there is this new block uh, which is being discussed these days and this is similar to that of a 
what I would say a SAP one as far as how we do it technically. So it is external oblique interfacial plane block. Now here uh, it will cover T6 to T8. So the most common indication is open cholecystectomy. And uh, the limitation is it has no visceral component of pain relief. So it is only the somatic block. I have used it in for, uh, you know, uh, also for uh, PTBD surgeries and uh, patient had good analgesia after the procedure. Though they use local infiltration at the time of uh, insertion of needle, but postoperatively patients are much more comfortable if we use this block. Most of these patients are with borderline coagulation issues. So here where the probe is placed, uh, it is somewhere uh, just uh, on the anterior axillary line and at the level of T6. So here, this is the sixth rib and we have external oblique muscle and the internal intercostal muscle. And in the schematic diagram, you can see the drug is deposited at around sixth rib in the anterior axillary line area, just medial side. And the, we open up the external oblique and the space between the intercostal muscles. So it's a very superficial block. You can even hit the sixth rib near the anterior axillary line and just deposit 20 mils of uh, local anesthetic. All these blocks are for post-op analgesia. So 0.2 percentage ropivacaine or 0.25 bupivacaine, levobupivacaine is just good enough. And this is uh, between rib and external oblique muscle. So there is something called as Brilma block. Brilma block is also being discussed. And it is the block which is blocking the lateral branches of intercostal nerve at mid axillary line. So this was first uh, uh, you know, discovered in 2013. And uh, there are multiple indications. Most commonly it is used for you know, uh, helping with the uh, drain of uh, after the breast surgery because it may come little lower down and it has the all the pex block and the sap block may not cover it so this brilma block uh, is done more or less uh, in the upper axilla and the la deposition between the serratus anterior and the external intercostal muscle at mid axillary line around 20 mils of local anesthetic and uh, it has been found useful. Now, the effect is also extrapolated in upper abdominal surgery, something more or less similar to external oblique interfacial plane block. So, the analgesia is uh, comparable. Now, here, this block was compared with SAP and subcostal TAP. Um, so, uh, the result conclusion where they were equally efficacious for, it was used for laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So these blocks probably may not cover the, uh, the visceral component of pain, uh, but yes, it will cover the incision site and can be of uh, utilization there. Another uh, important block is tilip block. Uh, so we have some, seen erector spiny plane block and this is a tilip, which is a thoracolumbar interfacial plane block. And this is a commonly used block for spine surgeries. So it is a modified ESP block and there are good systematic uh, review and meta-analysis to support. And we too have done this and uh, it was beneficial. So after giving prone position to the patient, you can use a probe and deposit the drug. And how we do it, I'll just explain. So erector spiny muscle has three components. One is multifidus, second is longismus thoracis, and third is iliocostalis. So this uh, image is from Qi Jin Ching YouTube video. There are other uh, articles also, but he has done a modification which I wanted to share. So I have utilized it. So here you can see the transverse process. So when we deposit the drug at the tip of transverse process, it is ESP block. Now here, this is a superior articular process. So drug is deposited between MF and LT. So two components of uh, erector spiny muscle when we deposit the drug. So essentially it is only covering the dorsal rami. So we are not here to address the ventral rami aspect. So this is essentially a dorsal rami blo block because it is going to cover the incision of spine surgery. So this is where we deposit the drug and Qi Jin Chin has modi modified it and he said we also give a second injection 
as the needle is coming out to cover the cutaneous innervation and little subcutaneous infiltration here. And we have done this and 20 ml on both sides and it has worked better than local infiltration by surgeon and patient was having pain relief almost for two to three days. Very good uh, and efficacious block. And I think uh, it takes some amount of time to change our surgeons. Uh, but uh, uh, with ultrasound and after prone positioning, uh, if surgeon, the senior surgeon is still yet to come, you can utilize that window uh, and perform this block. So as I was mentioning uh, about the inguinal hernia surgery blocks and all those blocks, so <clears throat> what is the recipe? We use uh, ilioinguinal iliohypogastric block and we use genital branch of genitofemoral nerve block. The subcostal nerve block is local infiltration and also the crossing over of nerves from contralateral side is also local infiltration. So we have already covered ilioinguinal iliohypogastric and these lower two are local infiltration. So I'll just explain you. So inguinal hernia. <clears throat> so I'll be blocking ilioinguinal iliohypogastric at ASIS. We'll open up that tap plane with around 20 mils of local anesthetic. And then uh, this is the genitofemoral nerve. It divides into the femoral branch and genital branch of genitofemoral nerve. So here I'm going to place an uh, ultrasound probe. Uh, there is a pubic tubercle here and just one centimeter lateral to pubic tubercle. I'm going to do an in-plane technique just over the inguinal ligament. I'm going to identify the vas deferens and uh, just lateral to it is the nerve. So I'll be showing you the ultrasound image as well. Now this is the genital branch of genitofemoral nerve. The third local infiltration is along the midline because there may be crossover of cutaneous fibers coming from other side. So this is just a local infiltration. So uh, tap block with addressing specifically Q, uh, the ilioinguinal iliohypogastric, then the genital branch of genitofemoral and the midline local infiltration will provide very good quality of hernia block. So I'm just highlighting the genital branch of genitofemoral nerve. So it's motor supply is cremastic and sensory supply is over the scrotal screen, the labia majora, round ligament and uh, fascia tunica and other things. And here is a pubic tubercle and just by the side, almost one centimeter lateral, you can place a probe over the inguinal ligament. So here you will see the femoral artery becoming continuous as the external iliac artery. So I'm just going to show you uh, another image which we have seen in the initial half. I'm just trying to get that image. Uh, so the vascularity, you need to know where is the femoral nerve. I'm just bringing it. So you can see here again the femoral nerve. It is becoming external iliac. Uh, sorry, the femoral artery becoming the external iliac artery. So if we know this anatomy very well, that how this has become uh, like this. The similarly, in this ultrasound diagram, you can see this femoral artery becoming the external iliac artery. Just above that here, the hypoechoic image in the, in the spermatic cord is the vas deferens and we are not supposed to put any needle here. But you can see this star mark, that's the genital branch of genitofemoral nerve. And we just have to deposit the local anesthetic. Around 15 to 20 ml of local anesthetic is deposited. So if we have done these two blocks well and with some local infiltration along midline, uh, hernia block will act very well. Those surgeons who are not used to uh, doing uh, hernia under block, we have to train them and we have to ask them to be gentle. When they pull the hernia sac, uh, that time patient may have a little bit of pain. So we have to tell them to be gentle and surgery can be done very well. Now assessment of block, we have already covered. Each interfacial block needs to be assessed with a cold saline or a spirit swab and see whether there is hypoesthesia or not. And we have to follow these patients up as well. So initially when the block is done bilaterally, the extent can be T6 to L1. Slowly it becomes comes around periumbilical depending on what block, what direction, what concentration and how long. So sometimes there may not be any hypoesthesia, but patient has good analgesia. So that has also been observed.
I'm not touching upon the continuous catheter aspect, but we have used rectus sheath catheters, tap catheters, ESP catheters, uh, paravertebral catheters, SAP catheters, ULB catheters. And we have slowly moved to intermittent boluses, six hourly or eight hourly. In our department, we have this new fuser pump, multi-rate, uh, then PCA pump. And more recently, we also have program intermittent boluses. So either a resident can give a bolus of around 0.2% rope vacant six or eight hourly, three times a day, or you can set with the help of this type of a pump. Uh, so we have this pump in our department. So just uh, to end our session, I'm just opening up these ideas. Uh, you know, suppose a patient has an open cholecystectomy. There are so many options to choose like oblique subcostal tap or a brilma or a SAP or a rectus sheath or LA infiltration at port, you have thoracic paravertebral, we have ESP, we have thoracic epidural, we have quadratus lumborum, either anterior or posterior. We have external oblique intercostal facial plane block. So uh, how to choose a block? Uh, it depends on your first, the training. Uh, level one blocks are definitely all those superficial blocks like uh, ESP block and tap block. QL, uh, uh, especially the anterior and posterior are uh, block deep seated. So we have to be very sure about the coagulation aspect. A little bit of training is required. They cannot be done without ultrasound. So do not venture with, you know, pop technique or something unless, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, this is my own personal opinion. I would like to utilize ultrasound because uh, when Rafe uh, discovered first time this tap block in 2007, uh, then 2009, uh, it has fallen in disrepute because uh, people were doing the needling with pop technique, uh, you know, in 2009 and it has caused a peritoneal injury, kidney injury. So interfacial plane blocks are uh, because of ultrasound only because if there is any nerve, it can be blocked with PNS and therefore peripheral nerve blocks can be very well managed with PNS. But the discovery of interfacial plane blocks is mainly because of use of ultrasound. And with ERAS, uh, I think we are moving ahead. And I would like to end with, uh, again, the buzzword, how we the anesthesia is moving. More and more of local infiltration, peripheral nerve blocks as far as possible. Uh, we do not want an insensate clean. We want to discharge our patient early, opioid sparing, motor sparing, site-specific, procedure-specific, and multimodal. So I think, thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, hopefully, uh, I have added some value to this discourse. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Amit Dixit. There was an, that was an excellent talk. And uh, I think uh, it has clarified many doubts in the minds of students and others who are listening to your talk. Uh, uh, before we wind up, we have one more quiz by Dr. Viral. And Viral has put in a lot of effort towards this quiz. And it was a first quiz also was nice. I know the second quiz also is very good. Thank you for that, Viral. And we go ahead with your quiz now. Sure, madam. Thank you. So again, for all the participants, there will be 10 multiple choice questions and you'll be given five minutes. The questions will be on the abdominal wall blocks. So you just have to mark the correct answer and submit your quiz. The results will be shared, uh, shared with you at the end of, after submitting the quiz. So I'm just sharing the... I hope everyone is able to see. Yes. You'll be given five minutes to solve these 10 questions. Yes, sir.
the people who have joined from Zoom will be able to uh, participate in the quiz. The people who are on the YouTube won't be able to access it. Two more minutes. I can see many people joining late for the quiz, so I'll give an extra minute for them. I think I'll end up with now and share the correct answers. So I'm closing the quiz window now. Okay. Share the results. So all of you will be able to see the correct answer. So for the first question, the Takila block is the QL3 block. 
the rectus sheath second the rectus sheath block involves deposition of drug between the rectus abdominis and the posterior uh, rectus sheath third question subcostal block involves deposition of villi between the rectus and the transverse abdominis muscle both the uh, uh, deep circumflex iliac artery pulsations can be seen uh, while giving hernia block. QL2 block is given uh, the posterior lateral corner of posterior to QL muscle. Sixth question, all of the following are true about uh, thoracolumbar interfacial block except that it, uh, it targets the dorsal remi, not the ventral remi. Seventh, uh, external, external oblique internal postural plane block is to be given at the level of Sixth and seventh ribs. And all of the following are true about thoracolumbar fascia, except the anterior layer, which lies anterior to the QL muscle, not the psoas major muscle. Nine question: Which of the following statement is true about QL three block? That the drug is to be deposited between the epimyceum of quadratus lumborum and at the thoracolumbar fascia. The last, the bony landmark is in, uh, for erectus spinae block is the transverse process. Thank you all. Thank you, madam. Okay, so thank you, Viral, and uh, there's a brilliant uh, feedback for both the speakers. You've been ex excellent speakers, and the feedback is really excellent from everybody. Uh, most of the questions are answered, I think, in the chat box. Only one question for me. Why, how do you prolong the QL block? Dr. Shilpa Tivaskar is asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we we have done this. Uh, I've shared that video uh, photo of placing a catheter there. So if uh, the patient condition is all right, uh, I mean from the coagulation aspect because it's a deep seated block, we can either use uh, contiplex sets which are readily available, or we can use a epidural set, open up that area and can place a epidural catheter. So placing a catheter in that area is one good. Uh, thought. Uh, another thing is when our cat, uh, I have shown and shared uh, the, that photo, when uh, the integrity of thoracolumbar fascia was distorted by the surgeon. So we are not sure whether our QL block will act or not. In that case, a rescue ESP block can also be a savior in that area. And if we are, we are not sure about a continuous catheter technique, then a single shot uh, ESP block or it can be repeated later as well so two times uh, second or third uh, day we can repeat that because esp it is easy to repeat in a uh, in a resource limited setting whereas ql block will definitely require all the ultrasound and other gadgets as well uh, hopefully i'd like to ask one question to amit yes. Uh, yes. this ql can cause a quadriceps ql3 especially can cause quadriceps paralysis or paralysis and you have catheters Will it not cause uh, quadriceps paralysis? Or what is your experience about that? Yeah, so uh, I have shared that photo. Uh, whenever uh, we pass the needle and if we have to err more on the quadratus lumborum side while injecting the drug. So if the drug has gone in the quadratus lumborum, it is okay. It is still, uh, people say that it is QL4 block or something. But if we overshoot the target and mo move our needle more towards the swass side, then we have already breached the thoracolumbar fascia in between and we have gone on the uh, uh, swass side. So within the swass muscle, when uh, some drug uh, is in the substance of swass muscle, then it can cause partial lumbar plexus like action. So uh, then it can lead to femoral weakness and the block actually will be more of a partial lumbar plexus block than a QL3 block. So we have to be careful not to pass our needle into the substance of source muscle and this can be very well avoided. So okay. guarded needling, yeah. uh, uh, aliquots uh, and hydrodissection as the needle is progressing. Thank so you. this uh, analogy, question. sorry, this yeah, analogy has also been extrapolated uh, that when somebody is doing, uh, say, we use the shamrock view for QL block. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the shamrock view is used for QL3 block, also for lumbar plexus block. So if you have a complex hip surgery and you have done a lumbar plexus block, so while withdrawing the needle, we can even do QL3 block in addition to lumbar plexus. Because it has also been shown that in cadaveric dissection studies, the QL3 block, if we do it correctly, 
will also provide hip analgesia by indirect paravertebral action. So mechanism is different. So one is lumbar plexus block plus an addition of a QL3 block will produce dense analgesia for hip surgery. So while the needle is coming out for after doing lumbar plexus, ultrasound guided lumbar plexus block, we can just some deposit some drug also for QL3. All right. But I also believe that whatever precautions you take, quadriceps paralysis should be remembered. Yes, I yes. think it can happen. In which, it, uh, can happen. it can happen. It we, can we happen have because be... the thoracolumbar fascia is so well connected. The drug can yeah. go anywhere and there is individual variability. So these things can happen. Only one sure. question to you. Do you know why it is called the tequila block? Why is it called the tequila block? P -Q -L. Is the author like tequila or what is it? No, he, I, we were there uh, when Dr. Borglum gave his talk and Dr. Borglum said that he said it is transmuscular quadratus lumborum TQL. So one of his just friends said that TQL is tequila. So then oh. tequila shot and it just come. Nothing. Tequila uh, must be his friend's <laughs> favorite. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say Amit is a teetotaler. He would know. <laughs> So you should have given the answer, huh, Harshan? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any more questions? So I think uh, after today's discussion, uh, tomorrow everyone will be interested in doing these blocks or at least uh, some newer blocks, what Brilma block or, you know, we have external oblique interfacial plane block, uh, these different, different blocks and their usage advantages Definitely in resource limiting limited settings, also the SAP and other blocks, ESP block, uh, we can use wherever we are going. So it is not limited only to ERAS and uh, high corporate setup or government institution, but anyone and everyone, including uh, nursing home practices, freelancers, all can use. Uh, there was one patient who was not getting off the ventilator in ICU and they just did a bilateral ESP block and patient was breathing well. So then they could get him off the ventilator. So multiple indications. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good application of blocks. Pain relief and making somebody breathe well. Yeah. So I don't think we have any more questions. Most of the questions are answered. Harshal has answered a good question from Shilpa. Pre-op or post-op the block should be given. Would you like to say it again? Yeah, so I mean... It makes sense to put pre-op blocks because one is obviously the anatomy is not distorted, especially in breast patients when, you know, the, 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 the surgery has been done, then you lose the facial planes and then to put local anesthetic there is not the best. Surgeons obviously don't like once the surgery is done to put anything near that area. It technically becomes difficult as well. Even for abdominal patients, when you're doing laparoscopic procedures, the view that you get after the laparoscopy is completely distorted because sometimes there is air that goes into these facial planes and you can never decide which exactly is the facial planes you're putting in. So that's what, and most importantly, doing it preoperatively gives you good intraoperative analgesic effect as well. So it becomes sort of opioid sparing. Uh, so your amount of local, uh, the opioids that are required, anesthetic that is required comes down drastically. So patients are much more awake. They can move about mobilization, eating, drink is much faster from ERA's point of view. It is great. And I think overall makes sense to put it preoperatively there. Ah, I think the question comes when if you can't put catheters and if it's a long procedure, whether you would want to do it postoperatively. But that probably will depend on case to case basis. If you can do it pre-op and post-op, great. But if given a choice, I would always do it pre-op. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and about the surgeon saying we'll put the local and we can give with it with between facial planes. That's a problem with every theater, I think. So before they get a chance to say that, I think the second person should be ready with the equipment and the local anesthetic and the other person gets in busy, you know, the second person should come and give the block. Yeah. That would be better than, you know, allowing them to say that I can also do it uh, once I inside. Because they see all the facial planes and they have this habit of like, I will put it like why you are taking the trouble. So we'll have to. No, so we have changed the practice. I'll tell you where the from the thoracic point of view, uh, we, we had, they had the thoracic surgeons putting in the blocks from inside while doing the procedure. But when we started doing the thoracic paravertebral blocks, they said, no, no, I think it probably works. Because, however, even in a corporate setup, after some time, two or third, second, third day, obviously they are seen more by them. We 
very rarely get to see so many patients postoperatively. So you get the feedback from surgeons saying that your blocks are better than putting local anesthetic during the procedure. I think they come back and tell. That's... We have done one study here uh, in our department when this was even uh, um, with uh, PEX block and we have a surgeon and there was a breast fellow also with us and uh, from our side. So it was a combined venture. And uh, because uh, for this study, there was a protocol design and we got the ethical committee approval and everything. So the surgery fellow also got to know what are the anatomical innovations in this area. And then they planned for local infiltration in the PEX 1 and 2 area. And then uh, versus how we do it with ultrasound guided. So when we have compared that, the results were equivocal. But I think the key aspect is because the surgeons were very much interested in knowing the correct innovation and deposition in a correct area. And uh, then somehow this trend has picked up with our department and surgeons are now uh, good in doing uh, local infiltration. So if you talk about even uh, when we extrapolate a similar thing to knee and hip orthoplasty, Nowadays, the orthopedic workshops and surgeons, they have cadaveric workshops for local infiltration analgesia. So unless the surgeon is trained enough to do good local infiltration, the results can be variable. Thank you. And I think uh, we can wind up today's session. It was, I think, excellent. And uh, I'm sure everybody has learned the thoracic as well as the abdominal blocks very well and everybody will be very enthusiastic about doing these blocks. Uh, and thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, madam. Thank you. Thank you, Viral. Hello. Yeah, hello. So, uh, at the onset, I would like to thank both our excellent speakers, Dr. Harshal sir and Dr. Dixit, sir, to for such excellent presentation, clear-cut anatomy, amazing videos and showing, uh, discussing the clinical applications of all the blocks and making things so simple, look so simple for all of us. Also, I would like to thank Dr. Deepa Kani, Madam, for moderating this session and making it amazingly interactive. About the quiz part, I would say that this idea was of Dr. Amit Dixit, sir. He told that, let us make this uh, webinar a little bit more interactive and for audience also, let them participate and let's get feedback from them. So thank you, sir, for that. Also, I would like to thank all the senior members of ISA Mumbai Metro branch and SAMS and all other city branches for gracing this occasion. I would like to thank Dr. Yogita Patil, Madam, and uh, Dr. Sona Dave, Madam, and many other senior members who joined and stayed till uh, so long. Dr. Shilpa Tivaskar, Madam, the GC member of Maharashtra. And last but not the least, to all our amazing participants who uh, attended the webinar in such huge numbers to make it a successful. Uh, and uh, I just hope that all of us have learned quite amazing things from today's webinar and will be starting to practice newer blocks uh, for achieving our target of a pain-free patient. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Good night. Yeah. Good night.